Well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Bob McDowell, uh, I'm a partner in Florin Capital, and I'm your host for this afternoon. Um, we will not have joining us uh, Nick uh, Hadfield this afternoon, unfortunately, but because of, first of all, the big demand we've had for this webinar, and because Bori has quite a lot to say on the subject, uh, he has very kindly taken over the, the whole thing. What I will do, however, I will uh, ask one or two questions, which I think Nick Padfield would 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 have asked had he been uh, participating in the webinar. Um, so, AI and the law uh, can they cope with the rapid existence of AI capabilities? Um, first of all, I, I, we need to thank our sponsors, as always. Uh, very very helpful very useful uh, uh, to us um this uh will mori will speak for about uh, 15 to 20 minutes we have a couple of polls and thereafter we will go into discussions and questions and i would suspect expect on a subject like this we will have quite a lot of um interesting and uh, challenging uh, uh questions um Mori, just by way of background, uh, is is a lawyer turned technology innovator. Uh, he 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 is engaged at the forefront of AI in a number of roles and uh, positions, and I think he will reference those uh, during during his uh, his presentation. So I think with more without more ado, I will get out of the way and ask Mori to uh, to present just. Before I go, saying that we do welcome questions, please put questions into the uh, into the question box. Uh, no, uh, no emails, no texts or anything like that. Questions into the into the box, and we look forward to a lot of interesting and challenging questions. With that, over to you, Murray. Well, thank you very much, Bob. It's um, I've joined, you know, I've joined a number of ZN webinars, but this is the topic that I'm probably the most interested in. And I'm very excited to say a few words about it today. I'm gonna to talk about three things. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the differing regulatory approaches that we have to AI. Then I'm going to say a few words about ChatGPT, which seems to be on everybody's lips. And then talk a little bit about the broad question around AI uh, personality and um, sentience. Uh, you know, can AIs, are they conscious? Um, and well, I'll, I'll leave my, uh, my my views on that till later. So uh, as Bob said, I, I have a number of roles. This previous slide showed me as CEO of LearnerShape, which is a small ed tech startup that I'm quite proud of. Uh, the other thing that I'm spending even more time on now is being on the board of directors and general counsel of PeopleCert, which is a, another education technology company that's starting to think about AI. And uh, and I'll speak to those points a little bit as I proceed. So. You know, in terms of AI regulatory approaches, I'm going to speak about three, starting with the EU, uh, where I kind of call it regulation with a capital R. I love this quote from the EU digital strategy website that EU uh, is going to, you know, seize the opportunity and have control over digital transformation. And, you know, this is, uh, this quote, I think, enca encapsulates the approach and probably problem with EU regulation is it's very uh, goal-directed, policy-driven, and it tends to, by as a result, um, over-regulating uh, and really impede the growth of business. And that isn't what the EU wants to do. It wants to make things great for business, but it, it can be really problematic. Um, and whatever you think about Brexit, um, this is not one of the, the bits of the EU to like the most is the, the tendency to overregulate. There is a proposed EU AI Act now, and like most EU um, legislation, it's well intentioned, um, but it's complex for the regulated businesses if it were to pass in the in the current form. It takes four, it divides AI into four categories, unacceptable risks, the main one there being public biometrics, so in public places. Uh, looking at people and deciding through AI who they are, something that's widely used in China or increasingly used in China, 
uh, would be prohibited in the EU. Then the big, the area that's of real interest is the high risk area, which is regulated. And it's in many crucial sectors, including biometrics, critical infrastructure, education, you can read it there. And there are detailed regulatory obligations on proposed regulatory obligations on use of AI in these areas, including, I've included a couple here, uh, risk management for foreseeable use of your AI system. So it's a little bit hard to foresee. So uh, what for a lot of companies, how do you foresee how ChatGPT is going to be used? For LearnerShape, we build tools to build uh, custom education applications. How can we foresee how people are going to use our tools? Another requirement is complete and error-free data, which uh, for those of you who are data scientists, that's something that is virtually impossible to ensure. People spend, data scientists spend a lot of time on their data pipelines. They try to get them complete and error-free, but actually achieving that, very difficult. Uh, LearnerShape, my company, participated in a study uh, called uh, by a program called Open Loop, which is sponsored by Meta, to look at the EU AI Act. It was a lot of, with a lot of small companies, and it was really interesting to talk through these issues. There are also areas, um, limited risk areas like chatbots, where you just have to uh, be transparent that an AI is involved, and lower risk things that are unregulated. Next slide, please. So the you know the next approach I'll talk about is what the U.S. and the U.K. are doing, and it's more about setting out principles, signals to the market. So the U.S. in October 2022 came out with what they call Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, and sets out a set of principles which you can see listed here. They're high level. There is no proposal for direct regulation at this point. Probably some direct regulation will come out of it, but it's cautious steps. The EU um, did this a similar step in July of last year and uh, set out a set of principles as well. Uh, again, these are um, these are you know principles that are hard to disagree with, and and they're generally sensible and they show how the EU will approach these. Um, these issues of regulation. So the US and the UK are basically saying AI is something new. Uh, there are important policy questions that we need to consider. We're starting to signal the market where we might be going on this, but there is not particularly uh, aggressive regulation yet. Next slide, please. The, uh, the third example I'm going to talk about is China. So China is, um, you know, like in many areas, uh, we see this in chips, for example, where China has been largely cut off from U.S. and to some extent other Western chips. They're pursuing their own chip industry. Well, in AI, uh, where that hasn't happened to the same extent, they are nevertheless pursuing aggressively growth of their own domestic AI industry. In By some measures, like papers, China already leads the world in AI, although the U.S. is more influential still in many ways. Um, and this plan, which is uh, six years old now, is a pretty clear statement of, you know, taking a industrial strategy approach to seize the strategic opportunity for AI. And that's the way that China continues to think about it. As is also characteristic of, of China, they're pursuing an incremental regulatory approach. So not as aggressive as the EU uh, in terms of what's been proposed. They do have last year a new regulation on algorithmic recommendations, similar to what's already in GDPR in the EU to a certain extent. So the ability to opt out of algorithmic um, approaches to your, you know, using your personal data to make decisions. Um, there are some very new provisions called the deep synthesis provisions, which are governance of generative AI like ChatGPT and Dolly, which we'll talk about in a moment. And yet another characteristic of Chinese regulation is they tend to experiment on the local level. So in 2022, Shenzhen uh, and Shanghai, which are two of the most important um, economic regions, particularly Shenzhen for the technology industry, have come up with their some local regulations, which provide some uh, some control and then some advantages. It's a sort of a, a, a big mix of provisions there where they're trying to see what works. And then China has a tendency to take what works and spread it out as a 
as a national uh, as a national approach. So I don't know. It may be visible from my comments which one I favor, but we're going to run now on the next slide and uh, on your screen a slight poll. Uh, and Peter, if you could launch that poll. Um, so if you could vote um, which of these approaches makes most sense to you, um, and and then um, and let us know. Um, social policy driven in the EU, light touch as the US and the UK, and industrial policy driven in China. Those are summaries of what I have to say. Um, uh, we can give another few. Yeah, we'll give we'll give a few seconds for people to uh, to vote. Seconds for the poll. I can't see the results. Yeah, yeah, I can't either. Actually, how <laughs> about Peter? Whenever you're ready, let us know the results. So, um, so here we go. It's so interestingly, you know, I think I showed my my biases towards the light touch approach of the. Um, U.S. and the U.K., but we have over 50% of the people think Six. that is the social policy-driven approach, the more regulatory approach of the EU makes sense. And I, I somewhat wonder whether that's because of what's on my next slide, um, which is chat GPT, where we're all starting to see um, the potential for real, real change, uh, but also real um, effects and possibly negative effects of chat GPT. So, you know, briefly turning away from the law, I just want to talk about generally the risks and opportunities of ChatGPT and other large language models and generative AI. I wrote a blog about this through LearnerShape, and um, you know, I started with a quote uh, attributed to Zhou Enlai, who was premier of China. I think in uh, it was in the early 1970s. He was purportedly asked about, you know, what was the effect of the French um, Revolution? And his response was too early to say. Um, uh, you know, it, it turns out, I, re I researched this and it appears he was almost certainly talking about the Paris riots of 1968. So maybe at that point, a few years later, it was genuinely too early to say. And I'm sure that it's too early to say what the effect of chat GPT and generative AI is going to be. The technology, so to take a step back, LearnerShape, which we set up in 2019 uh, to improve education with AI, one of my key theses uh, in founding that company was seeing what was happening with AI innovation and saying, these public source innovations in AI are going to help us because uh, as a company, because these are innovations that we can use um, and then apply them in the education sector. And that has turned out to be um, true beyond what I expected. And this will this trend that the technology will keep improving is going to continue. Um, but there are risks. Um, the, the big risk that people are talking about, and I think these are the main risks, is ever easier disinformation. So we have a lot of problems with disinformation in our society through social media, and it's becoming, and other means. And not that this is a new problem, there has been disinformation for centuries, but uh, the ease of disinformation through social media and the increasing ease through AI is a real problem. The other problem that people talk about is disruption to the job market uh, and to education because it um, becomes awful easy to fake uh, fake essays and exam results, et cetera. Uh, those are serious problems. There, people have been talking about this, you know, disruption to the job market for years from AI. In general, technology tends to create more jobs than it. Uh, destroys, but there can be major dislocation and changes in jobs. Education, I think we will um, find solutions. We can leave that to the question period if people want to talk in more detail about that. On the other side, there are huge opportunities. I think they're virtually limitless. Um, Azim Azar, who's a well-known technology blogger in the UK, has recently analyzed this in terms of a general purpose technology, which means one like electricity that can be used to build many other things. Uh, and I think it's probably proper to think about it that way. There are so many things that can be built with generative AI tools. A few examples, uh, Toolformer was a recent paper, the idea that we can teach ChatGPT to talk to other services uh, and it can learn you know, how to call external services and then get its answer from those, pretty clever. Midjourney is a, um, 
is an image generation um, company that's taking off incredibly fast. And just general ideation. Um, you know, ChatGPT is a really good tool for generating ideas, even though it makes stuff up a lot of the time. Uh, it, it can pr prompt ideas fantastically well. A large number of corporates and other entities are very quickly beginning to experience, uh, experiment with this. Uh, as I mentioned, PeopleCert, where I'm on the board of directors, we've already started to look at it, and and polls show that a very large number of companies are are doing so. So, what can we do about this from a legal perspective? Well, uh, I see three general options. One is let the market work it out, um, and that's kind of where we are right now. There are very limited current legal restrictions. There are some. Uh, in the, as I mentioned, there's some in the EU, GDPR Article 22 about um, automated processing, uh, where there's effectively an opportunity to opt out of automated. You must be informed of automated pro processing and have an opportunity to be to opt out of it under GDPR and the China regulation on algorithmic recommendations that I mentioned. Uh, we could. There could be voluntary restrictions. Just I think last week there was a letter signed by a large um, group of well-known people, including Elon Musk, who's been worried about um, AI for years, uh, Yoshua Bengio, who along with uh, Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun are sort of thought of as the, the, uh, the founders of the current wave of AI, Gary Marcus, who's a leading critic, a, a whole lot of other leaders, um, uh, Steve Wozniak, in addition to those I have listed here, and over a thousand others. They suggested a pause on developing more um, on training more powerful uh, large language models. Um, that has drawn a firestorm of criticism from all kinds of directions. Uh, it's it's kind of interesting. Um, and I, I'm not optimistic that voluntary restrictions will work because there will be people who won't follow voluntary restrictions. Certainly in some countries, China is very unlikely to be particularly interested in voluntary restrictions. Or there could be new le legislation. And there, there's a real tough balance um, between safety um, and restricting innovation and free speech. We, we started talking about the EU, where the EU is often trying to regulate for very admirable social goals, but as a result, restricts innovation. And that can be a real problem. Uh, next slide, please. So moving on to the final area that I want to talk about. Um, is the idea of legal personality, that AI should be able to be like, like human beings and like companies, that AIs should be able to be legal actors. Um, some of the early William Gibson books go there in a quite interesting way, like uh, Neuromancer, where they have, the, um, they, they have a police force, the Turing police, uh, that uh, effectively police how, how much legal rights AIs have. And whether they're sentient, whether you know whether AIs can think. So the, the three pictures here on the left, we have Sophia. She's a robot who was created about five or six years ago, I think. It's largely a, a marketing trick, in my view. There's not much AI in Sophia. She can say some things, but it's uh, not very sophisticated. Although maybe it's been upgraded with ChatGPT and the like. Uh, but she was granted citizenship of Saudi Arabia at one point, um, which is interesting. Uh, in the middle is uh, Blake Lemoyne, who's a guy who attracted uh, a Google engineer who was attracted a lot of attention and then termination from Google as a result of saying that their Lambda large language model is sentient. Um, and then on the right is, um, <laughs> no, I'm thinking, I think therefore I am. Um, Descartes. <laughs> uh, uh, Rene Descartes. <laughs> this is, you know, in the middle of a webinar, your, your mind leaves you. But, um, you know, so, um, you know, we've said centuries ago, observed, for centuries we've been trying to figure out what consciousness is, and we know ourselves that we are conscious, but we can't identify whether something else, uh, some other entity is conscious. We can have, there's the, uh, you know, we can see indicia of consciousness. So my my thesis here is that we're not going to know whether an AI is actually conscious. Blake Lemoyne already thought that Lambda was uh, was conscious, is conscious, uh, seems unlikely. But what seems more sensible to me is to break it down into pieces, uh, which I'll talk about on my last slide. Next slide, please. So let's take some examples. Uh, 
On the left side, we have books and patents, it's an intellectual property. There are some really interesting examples about, uh, with large language models, what the copyright should be. So a lot of these large language models have processed a huge amount of training data, and we don't. They're they're very complex black boxes. So what they spit out on the other side is can be difficult to know why it's spit out. But to some extent, they memorize the inputs. So do they infringe IP? On the other side, there's the question of who owns the IP created by large language models. Does uh, does the um, entity that is deploying the large language model own the output? Very important and very important for the many companies that are building technologies on top of this. For patents, there's questions, can an AI be a, uh, can an AI be the inventor on a patent? There is a, a legal dispute in the UK between an, uh, an individual named Thaler, who's got a system called Dabas that he wants to uh, be the inventor on patents. They, it's been rejected so far, but it's um, now been appealed to the UK Supreme Court and it will be interesting to see what the outcome is on that. So if AIs can, uh, could be patenters, you know, uh, inventors, and they don't transfer the rights to somebody else as you can with a patent, what are they gonna do with the money? Are they gonna be able to put it in a bank? Should, should we allow AIs to have a bank account? And I think the answer to that may eventually be yes. Um, we allow corporations, which are fictitious and, you know, legal fictions that are the most among the most powerful entities on earth now to have bank accounts obviously um ais eventually may be allowed to have bank accounts as well in fact i suspect they will be allowed before long uh, taking some examples that are more out there should ais be allowed to vote this is really a thought experiment it seems to me the answer there is obviously no um, that uh, because for those of you in security, you may know the concept of a civil attack. You create a lot of, you can, you know, you create a lot of uh, actors and disrupt the market. If you can multiply AIs and get them to vote, they could very quickly take over from the human. So I would say that allowing an AI to vote is a bad idea. Um, and then finally, should we allow AIs to marry? The the photo at the top right is from a Chinese gentleman who I think in 2017 or 2018 wanted to marry this robot um, and uh, maybe counterintuitively I would say that I would be less worried about allowing uh, humans to marry AIs than I would allowing AIs to vote it seems strange to allow a human to marry an AI but maybe that should be a matter of choice as it is as we're broadening out the definition of marriage uh, it would not necessarily be hugely socially disruptive to allow that uh, although people who uh, argue for traditional marriage might disagree, but certainly less socially disruptive, I believe, than allowing AIs to vote. So as AIs become more effective, um, we're going to have to consider a, a host of these questions. And I think this is really where the rubber hits the road of the AI legal de debate, these granular questions. So I'll close um, my part of the presentation and before we move to questions with another poll. Artificial general intelligence is, um, is you know, what we call an AI that can do a variety of tasks like a human can, rather than just focus tasks. And the question is, you know, when when will we have it? Is it already here? Some people think that, you know, OpenAI has said um, uh, GPT-4 is kind of the beginning of artificial general intelligence. And will we have something we can call AGI within five to ten years, then twenty to thirty years? later than that or or never. Interesting to see uh, the views of the audience on that. We'll take another few seconds to let people record their votes. Thank you. Uh, so within five to 10 years. So people, I, I'm interested, 20% of people think it's already here, which is, uh, I, would I would be inclined to disagree with that, but there are certainly people who would agree with you. Five to 10 years is quite techno-optimistic. So we've got a quite techno-optimistic audience here. Uh, 20 to 30 years is probably where I would vote. Um, and I agree with the small uh, the small vote for later. I think if we have it, um, it will come within the next few decades. Never is interesting. And it, it's, it's a real possibility in my view as well. 
so with that, I've I've stayed within approximately the 20 minutes I wanted to speak, and I'm turning it back to you, Bob, for leading the rest of the discussion for I guess another 20 minutes. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Maury, for a, a very quick but uh, exhaustive canter through this fast developing, fast moving uh, area uh, of uh, technology and also the legal things from it. Um, if I may start off, because there will be a couple of questions Nick Padfield would have posed, uh, Mari. Um, given the, uh, the the different legal um, uh, thrusts from different jurisdictions, um, do, do, you, do you think this will inhibit the development of AI or fragment it around jurisdictions? I think it depends which regulatory approach we take. But um, so I've been working in internet law since the 90s. And there was this idea initially that the internet, there John Perry, Perry Barlow in the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace, that the internet should be a free zone. It was apparent to us even then that it was going to be more regulated. Um, I think with the general, um, the general adversarial, the, the, the international environment has become a lot more adversarial than it was 10, 15 years ago. And that started to re result in a real fragmentation of the internet where the China has a somewhat isolated internet, Russia has an increasingly isolated internet. I think we could see the same thing happening with AI. I think it will be caught up in some of the same uh, social trends, uh, some, uh, global trend. And, um, you know, and particularly if EU, if there are things that are prohibited in the EU, they will happen somewhere. So I think the answer is yes, there will be some fragmentation. I hope it won't be too much. Uh, and the second question, and then I will uh, pass it over to uh, the other questions. Um, the, the, the law has always had a, a big struggle with keeping up with uh, technology developments. Do you think? Do you think there is a bigger gap here between the developments and the law there are, than there are in other areas of technology? Um, short answer is yes. Um, that's a that's a really good and hard question. Um, <laughs> I will give you two reasons why I think the answer to that is yes. I probably want to think about it a little bit more to give a better answer, but the two reasons off the top of my head are one, this is a genuinely technically complex area. So the intuitions of why something works or doesn't from an AI perspective can require a fairly deep technical understanding of what the algorithms can and cannot do, um, the math that underlies them. I've spent a fair amount of time studying that over the last 10 years. Um, and it's less, it's less intuitive than, um, than looking at something like electric vehicle technology, you know, which is also hugely important to our society. But most people have a pretty good understanding of what it means to have electric vehicles, network of charging stations. There are a lot of follow on impacts of that that people um, that, that we're starting to see, but it's a little bit easier to understand. Um, the second reason is things are just moving very fast. Uh, it's, you know, ChatGPT was released just late last year. In a few months, the um, the impact it's had on people's attention is massive, and it looks like it's going to have um, very increasingly. You know, these things are going to continue to move very fast. I mentioned Azim Azar; he writes about us being in the exponential age, where people are things are just speeding up. They can't keep speeding up forever. And on the other hand, you have you know people Peter Peter Thiel, who's another you know uh, big technology investor, said they promised us flying cars, and we got 140 characters. So you know, he suggested that, that maybe the, the pace of technology innovation sometimes isn't as fast as as we think. Uh, but I, I do think this is coming very fast and it's going to be hard for the law to keep up. Okay. I, I will ask a third one on Nick's behalf. He would have asked this. Uh, if and how do you think the judiciary can become competent to uh, make judgment in, in, in AI? Uh, that's... Okay. So I, after law school, I spent a year as a law clerk on a U.S. federal court of appeals. And, you know, I was in my mid-20s. Um, that was a general purpose job. But 
a, another question I hadn't considered, but I think the judiciary is going to need to call on expertise. It may need to hire people, uh, young people, to help on on things like this. I, I don't, ex you know, maybe not every judge can have a, an AI expert, but there are some specialized courts, patent courts, that are specialized that could have those people on staff, or in particular cases, you know, uh, legal matters. Um, legal matters use expert witnesses to to deal with uh, technical questions and so i think that courts will need to be informed by expert testimony and the like to help deal with ai uh, ai matters thank you um let me now move on to we've had quite a number of questions um let me start with uh, one from david birch is ai simply too important for a light touch um, well, I'm very pleased to have Dave Birch listening to me. I read his uh, blogs on um, authentication and uh, digital money extensively. Um, Dave, thanks for your question. I don't know the, the answer to that. I mean, the EU regulators would certainly um, agree with that. And the authors of this recent letter, um, Elon Musk and Yoshua Bengio and the likes, I think would probably say that. Uh, so. Uh, I think the answer may be yes, that we can't uh, not regulate, that this is too important. I would be disinclined to go as far towards sweeping regulation as the EU has proposed in the EU AI Act and look for targeted areas of regulation to maintain essential safety. And what essential safety means, I don't know. I think it's uh, that's going to be hard to figure out exactly what we need to do to be safe, but we should try to do so, and that some kind of regulation probably is sensible. Thank you. Um, and another question from Arnold Lucas. Uh, as for the US, there are numerous state laws, in particular on biometric AI. How do you view 50 laws regulating AI in the USA, Ari? Well, that's, um, it's a problem. Um, you know, uh, this is something I, I'm, you can all hear, uh, probably I still have an American accent after 20 years living in the UK. In fact, I'm sitting outside Washington, D.C. Um, as I give this talk. And, and I've advised on U.S. law for a long time. Um, this happens in U.S. states. It's happening with privacy law right now uh, that w there is no national U.S. privacy law analogous to GDPR, although it's being debated in Congress. California uh, and Virginia and Colorado have privacy statutes, and there's a couple of others. I think it's Colorado. Um, there's a couple of others coming down the pike, and businesses can have a real, really difficult time keeping up with this. The, the solutions are generally, well, it, it can be good for lawyers, but then ultimately, uh, if it becomes confused enough, one hopes that the federal government will step in Congress will step in and regulate in a way that's sensible for the economy as a whole. I'm hopeful that that will happen at some point um, with AI. It's what usually happens in the U.S. when a sector becomes important enough. And the way the U.S. Constitution works is that in things that affect interstate commerce, uh, Congress does have the power to preempt state laws and and um, and you know and create a national law. Okay, thank you. Um... And another question concerning U.S. and U.S. law. In the U.S., they have the fruit of the forbidden tree doctrine applied to AI. That is, if illegally obtained data is used to train an AI model, the entire model needs to be erased, as the Kerbo case seems to say. What is your view on this case? Um, I don't know that specific case, so I can't comment on it. Um, the fruit of the forbidden tree is, uh, it's generally a Fourth Amendment doctrine, which is the prohibition on search. Um, and it says that if um, if, uh, if a search has been done illegally, then you can't use the, the results, if you, you can't use the results of that to prosecute somebody. Um, I would be surprised if that rule, relates to uh, the results in deletion of entire um, AI models. Uh, I could see courts limiting um, 
limiting the use of AI models um, where the data in them is illegal. Um, you know, it, we've already seen, I think last week, that Italy has banned ChatGPT because it thinks that the data were, uh, were collected in a way, it's, I, I believe it's the Garante, which is the Italian Data Protection Authority, which took this action. They haven't fully banned it, but they've said that uh, ChatGPT hasn't properly processed and gathered personal data. So uh, I think the question is a good one. How far it will go is um, is hard to know, and will probably have to be worked out by courts and regulators and legislatures as we go. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions on education. Uh, one from uh, Robin uh, Agarwal, and the second from Christopher Fogtal. Um, and essentially, both ask, uh, what is the most obvious uh, case use for good? Uh, in education, and the other one is, what problems in education do you think AI can solve? So, how, what, what what is the benefit of AI for education, Mari? Well, good questions. I think the first the first questioner may be Rohin uh, Agrawal, who's uh, yeah. a friend of mine, and um, thanks, Rohin, for the question. Um, so, this is what uh, LearnerShape is uh, is working on quite a bit. You know, my thesis is education is complicated, more complicated than people know. And so we're trying to enable, create AI and other tools, other digital tools that can be assembled to create um, AI applications that can be used in a bespoke way to solve very specific education problems because context matters a lot in education. The places where I'm seeing this, you know, the places where you see AI being used a lot in education, and AI has affected the education sector less than it's affected other sectors. But the places where we see it being used a lot is adaptive learning, uh, where um, you know you get asked a series of questions, and if there are areas that you know well, then the learning system doesn't spend as much time on those. Uh, it moves on to areas that you know less well. Um, there and the other area is recommendation. Uh, recommendation of content to learn particular tasks. That's uh, an important area. But I think there will be a whole host of areas. I, I was, uh, there is a com company in Korea called Read, R-I-I-I-D, that I encountered last week at an exhibition. And they're doing a fascinating thing where they are, they have a system where they ask questions, um, and the goal is not to give you questions in areas that you are weak on or in areas that you particularly need review, but to ask questions in a way that promotes learning uh, so that they do an analysis across their question database of which question for this particular individual is going to promote their ultimate learning the best, which I think is a fascinating approach. And they do that with transformer-based models Transformer is a kind of AI technology that underlies most of our large language models like ChatGPT and GPT-4. Um, so fascinating, I, I, that's a brief answer of some areas that I see are interesting. What the, er, the reason why I'm working in AI in education is I think there's a lot to play for, a lot of new areas that we will be able to change. Thank you. Um, and a, a further question from James Say. How does copyright intellectual property laws apply? If my published work is used to train an AI tool without my knowledge, uh, as the tool like like uh, GPT and uh, Midjourney do, so so um, so I illicit use of uh, of my published works. So oh, this is an unresolved question, and it's a massive question. Um, yeah. Take the, the take the first question. You know the illicit training. I mean, if somebody buys a copy of your copyright work, um, so th they first need a legitimate access to a copy of it to use it for training. They can buy a copy of it and use it for training. There's no prohibition on somebody who's purchased the work legitimately uh, using it for training. But the qu real question is is um, well, will people, first of all, will people later try to restrict that? You know, 
try to license their works in ways that don't allow them to be used for AI training? I think that's a question that people probably haven't thought about until the last year or so. But if the AI model that has been trained then spits out um, you know, answers that are uh, that take a um, substantial portion of the work, at least under the UK copyright law, if there's a substantial taking of the work, it would be an infringement. It's a little bit hard to prove this because these AI models uh, are, they're kind of a pile of, of linear algebra as the XKCD cartoon put it. Um, they're not, there's not a, a linear mapping between the training data and what comes out. There's, it's a very complex mapping, but in many cases it looks like um, they are spitting out infringing um, infringing information, and that may may be prohibited. This is a a massive legal question, not yet resolved, that will be consequential for a large number of AI businesses that use generative tools. Thank you. Um, a question from Dave uh, uh, Fiheni: um, Does the hyper acceleration of LLMs and the generative AI force the debate between consumer privacy and digital identity weigh up the agenda? Um, I think, well, I think the consumer privacy and digital identity debate is one that's been coming for a long time. The EU has been um, in the forefront of this with the Data Protection Directive um, taking effect in 98, I believe, and um, and the GDPR in 2018. So in other countries, I think the answer is yes. We've in the recent years already seen a spread, we've seen a robust data privacy laws spread to other countries. It's a matter of real debate in the US, as, as I said earlier, it uh, was reflected earlier, there's a number of US states with laws now, Congress has been delay, uh, debating laws for a couple of years um, and a lot of other countries. So I think that um, the hyper acceleration of LLMs, as the question put it, uh, will um, will also speed up that debate about privacy. And uh, let me uh, conclude, I think we've got time for one more question, with yet another question from Dave Birch. Um, uh, Dave thinks that Malta was proposing to give legal uh, personhood to smart contracts and thinks they still hand out investment passports. So, that, so it doesn't seem cra seem too crazy. Uh, doesn't seem too crazy that um, we might have smart contracts getting investment. But yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe smart contracts can have citizenship of Malta. Well, that's a good. I, <laughs> I assume that Dave is asking that slightly tongue in cheek, um, and not not because it's not possible, but because it's a slightly funny thing to think about. But I think those are the kind of questions we're going to need to answer. I mean, smart contracts are uh, mechanistic um, rules that are that execute on the blockchain, so they're not anything like AGI. Um, they're they're not particularly contractual, or in many cases, not particularly smart. But um, but the, it is an interesting question that if Malta can give legal personality to smart contracts, treating them like a, a company actor would, uh, then mm -hmm. person, legal personality for AI agents may not be too far behind, at least for certain purposes. Well, we're, we're, there are still a, an enormous number of questions which we will uh, hand over to you, Mori, to uh, to, to respond to personally to people. But let me conclude with uh, one interesting one uh, from Philip Middleton. How would uh, how would an AI be convicted legally sanctioned? Well, yes, that's we've got the same problem with corporations. So we do. Um, we do. you know, corporations, um, you know, if you if you think hard about it, I mean people are uh, think about the fact when Amazon or Google has been punished, but Amazon or Google as a thing probably isn't that upset when it gets pump punished because Amazon and Google don't exist as a one being, a conscious being. Um, 
and so we we impose fines on them but there's a big debate about corporate criminal liability for the the minds behind it the human minds i think we probably will have to have the same debate about ai so i mentioned does an ai have a bank account i mean the two options for ai being sanctioned seem pretty likely to be similar to those for corporations either you can find the ai or you can have some kind of criminal liability on the human minds who are beyond, who should have responsibility for it. All right, look, well, unfortunately we've got to draw proceedings to a close, Mari. First of all, thank you very, very much for your time, for, 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 for the presentation, and equally for the, for, for the, for the questions. You clearly, you clearly relish this area of activity. I can see, yeah. I can see by, by, by your tone. But, and also for everyone, thank you very much for a very, very good and stimulating uh, group of questions, which I say will be passed on to Mori to answer if those which we didn't have time for. I think this webinar could probably have gone on for two hours, but such is such is life. Um, well, thank, thank you to Bob for Bob for organizing this. It's always a pleasure to speak, with, uh, you know, for ZN and the Financial Services Club, and with you, Bob. Uh, our our friendship goes back some time. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mari. And uh, I think that's it. Uh, we do have, um, there are there are two more um, uh, Financial Services Club um, coming up. Uh, there's one tomorrow on the 4th and another on the, on the 11th uh, over Easter. But in the meantime, I'd, I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining us today. Very, very stimulating. And uh, I think this subject will have to be repeated in the near future. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye.